Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show, where I, your rabbi, reveal how the world really works. Thank you for being tuned in to one of the very few shows in the entire digital universe that accepts absolutely no hush money whatsoever. We speak freely on this show about the topics you really care about, and not just the things you care about today, but the things you cared about yesterday and the things you'll care about tomorrow. Uh, With almost no exception, with very few exceptions, the show is not tied to specific events. And one of the features essential for life success and just as essential for understanding how the world really works is to fully understand the downward pulls in human nature. The way the good Lord created us, or for those of you who prefer to follow the idea that human beings are here because of a lengthy process of unaided and random materialistic evolution, in that case, a quality that we've evolved. You see, the point that you need to know the reality about our natures is really far more important than where you believe those natures originally derived. But the important thing to realize is that we have certain pulls towards the the bad and the destructive and the negative. And as I'm going to tell you later in this show, uh, there is a beautiful quote that Catherine Hepburn speaks to Humphrey Bogart in an old movie called African Queen, where she really does tell the truth about nature and how absurd it is for anybody to excuse bad behavior by saying, well, it's natural, I'm just behaving naturally. And and we've got to recognize that, yes, we do have a tendency to uh, allow our lives to subside into clutter and chaos, and that tidying up and cleaning up and keeping things orderly is difficult and it's challenging, but it is part of successful living. And to understand that we have a pull towards yielding to our appetites of whatever they are. All of these things are true, but what I want to talk about now is understanding some of the much lesser known aspects of our pull towards the destructive. Let me explain that one of the very interesting aspects of this that God built into us is, funnily enough, even in our fantasies and unhealthy daydreams, even in the indulging of our baser desires, there still is a note of realism. How the world, really, it's so funny. In other words... Almost any man I know uh, wants to have more money, and that's a healthy thing. It's called ambition. Uh, Obviously, it can tip over into something unhealthy, but um, every man would like to have more money. Would every man like to be the richest man in the world? Would every man want to be um, Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook or Jeffrey Bezos of Amazon or, or Bill Gates of Microsoft? No, no. I, and almost no man walks around saying, I really want to be the richest. I, I dream of being the richest man. In the-. No, nobody thinks that. But most men say, I'd really like to double my income next year. That's what I want to do. I want to double my revenue somehow. That's perfectly healthy. But we don't dream of the improbable. We don't dream of the crazy, of the complete, you know, outlandish possibility with just not how we are we dream of what's at least remotely in reach uh when a, a single man you know dreams of having a beautiful woman he's not thinking of 
famous uh, film stars um, of uh, immeasurable pulchritude? Uh, no, for the most part, not. For the most part, it's somebody in reach. It's somebody where there's at least a chance he could actually meet her. Because somehow or another, there is a note of realism. So we have to understand that uh, we don't all lust for or desire or have strong appetites for all exactly the same things. Um, some people have to really fight a strong compulsion towards laziness. Other people have to fight a strong tendency to procrastinate. These are bad, destructive things. These are things that successful living means you have to overcome. But if you yourself do not suffer from an urge to procrastinate, then you have no idea of the pain and the fight that has to be endured by the person who is trying to overcome that particular bad trait and bad quality. Uh, there are people who have a pull towards alcoholism. Okay, so that's not something I personally relate to, but I really do know and understand what an incredible tough challenge it is for the person who decides to be off it. And so it is with all kinds of... Uh, um, unhealthy and ultimately destructive urges, uh, different people feel them to different levels. And so be aware that one of the most damaging and destructive of impulses is the desire to rule over other people, to lord it over other people, to exert authority over other people. Now, you know, like uh, lust for the absolutely unreachable woman or like the desire to be the richest man, this is not what most normal healthy people feel. And so I'm sure that almost everybody listening to this show says, what? I mean, I understand an urge to overeat, but an urge to exert power and authority over other people? I don't get that. And my whole introduction was to help you understand that, yes, this may not be something that grabs you, but it does grab many people. And so, for instance, uh, when I was recently standing in a line somewhere and the person we were all waiting to reach at the counter uh, leaned over, pointed at me and snarled, stand behind that line. No excuse me, no smile, not that I'd have been able to see it under that mask anyway, but I knew instantly what was going on, and that is that this person is getting a thrill, a real deep thrill, and, and one that, uh, that really ricochets around inside her being and gives her a deep, deep sense of, of happiness and pleasure, really sensual pleasure, by being able to exert authority. Uh, this is one of the things that draws people into positions of political and bureaucratic power. And it is very, and I'm going to say sensual, although I could go a little bit further than that, and say that exerting power over other people is not a, um, a, a bad characteristic. It is a bad characteristic, and I'm saying it's not a characteristic that I personally experience or feel, but I totally understand that it is real and that for many, many human beings, it is a an almost irresistible compulsion. And I have deep and profound respect for those people recognizing in themselves a desire to exert authority and power over others, but nonetheless is fighting to overcome that and to uh, to get beyond it. Uh, it's it's really terrific, and I, I do respect that. So to just be aware that many of the things that we are seeing during the coronavirus epidemic is uh, uh, are very much things that the majority of us may not understand. Some of the worst tendencies that we're seeing in our fellow citizens are things that we don't get. How can somebody behave like that, we say? 
Uh, how about the person who throws coffee over the person who's not wearing a mask or the person who hits somebody who's not wearing a mask? Again, you've got to understand that there are certain people, just as there are certain people who have a stronger pull towards drugs, there are people who have a stronger pull towards homosexuality, there are people who have a stronger pull towards alcoholism, the people feel different things. We all created uniquely. And in the same way, there are many people who have what you or I may not experience and may not even innately understand, but that is a deep, deep thrill at exerting power and authority over other people. So be aware of that and uh, maybe even be, uh, be a little sad and sympathetic towards that person who's so obviously getting a deep sensual thrill over not just asking if you could possibly do this or excuse me would you mind doing that but who is really deriving this deep pleasure from ordering you around i just want you to understand what's going on just as i want everybody in the uh, male half of the population to understand some of the things that i want to dive deeply into right now these are truly things that matter, things you care about at all times and that really are significant. And I, I very much hope that if you either are uh, a male between the ages of 13 and 23, or you know one, make sure that he hears this. Or if you are raising one, make sure that at the appropriate time of your judgment as parent that he hears this. Uh, maybe you have a friend or a relative who is raising a male human being between the ages of 13 and 23. Well, he'd want to know about this as well, because it does really matter. The overwhelming majority of the shows are about the timeless truths that I derive and that I've been taught from ancient Jewish wisdom, things that impact your life things that have to do with your finances, your faith, your family, your friendships, things you really care about. And uh, this show is no exception, excepting that it may be even just a little bit more of the above. As a matter of fact, I think I'm going to issue a parental discretionary uh, advisory here. Due to some violent content, parental discretion is advised. This really is not a show for everybody at all. As a matter of fact, I'm going to tell you very explicitly for whom today's show is intended. It is intended for men or boys between the ages of 16 and 23. So uh, if you happen to be a mother of such a man, then this show, not really for you. If you are a sister, if you're a daughter, in short, if you are a lady, if you are a woman of any age, this show, not really for you. I suggest you turn off and uh, find something more worthwhile and valuable to do, because this show is for men. And not only for all men, is it, but it's actually specifically for men between the ages of 16 and 23. And so if you are a young man, younger than the age of 16, this show's not for you. If you are a man older than 23, the show's not for you. This is specifically for people, for men, <laughs> male humans, between the ages of 16 and 23. Now, why did I choose specifically those ages? I mean, I could have said 15 to 25 or anything really, right? You've got the, the age group. Well, the answer is very simple. You see, in one of William Shakespeare's lovely plays, and hard to believe, 400 years old they are, uh, called A Winter's Tale, one of his characters is a shepherd 
who speaks about the problem with males between the age of 16 and 23. And he says, here's the problem. Boys between the ages of 16 and 23 uh, are either getting girls pregnant or they're fighting or they're irritating older people and aggravating older people. But whatever it is, they're, they're not being helpful. And he says, I, I just I wish they wouldn't be that age. I wish they'd go from 15 to 24 right away. Or, or ideally, if there was no alternative, maybe they could all fall asleep at the ages of 16 and wake up again when they're 24. And uh, and it's you know it's it's kind of funny. And then he he goes on to speak about uh, looking out and he and he sees uh, a 19 and 20 year olds out hunting in in very bad weather. And he, you know who but uh, but a scatterbrained person of that age would even think of doing this. And, uh, you know, now it's taken me about 300 words to to tell you about it. Uh, I'd love you to hear how Shakespeare does it all in 50 words. And so from Act 3, Scene 3 of Shakespeare's A Winter's Tale, and it's hard to believe, 400 years ago he wrote this. So when people say, I don't understand what the value is of Shakespeare, one of the values of Shakespeare is that uh, he he speaks of permanent principles, things that are as true now as they were then. That is what makes it valuable. He highlights true things that have always been true. So naturally, an enthusiast of ancient Jewish wisdom like me obviously uh, is awestruck by William Shakespeare. But enough of that. Why don't we listen to his words? So this is the shepherd speaking now in the third scene of Act 3. I would there were no age between 16 and 3 and 20, or that youth would sleep out the rest, for there is nothing in the between but getting wenches with child— wronging the ancientry, stealing, fighting. Hark you now, would any but these boiled brains of nineteen and two and twenty hunt this weather? (laughs) 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 It's good. It's it's just it's just very good. Uh, so that's what uh, what Shakespeare is talking about. And so I loosely take those ages for the basis of this particular show today, uh, in spite of the fact that obviously people who are uh, older than that might well be listening, and uh, possibly even people who are not really uh, men between the ages of sixteen and twenty three, but that is to whom I am primarily addressing this particular show, okay? That's what we're doing. And uh, I also want you to know that I'm going to be speaking very explicitly and uh, very pointedly, which is to say that I'm not going to be wasting time on a lot of nuance, and I'm not going to be wasting time on a lot of caveats and disclaimers, you know, if this doesn't apply to you, etc., etc., etc. I'm just going to lay out a number of principles that uh, men between the ages of 16 and 23 would really benefit from knowing about. Now, not absolutely everything is applicable to everybody, but I'm going to be laying out the principles, and I rely on your intelligence to determine what applies to you. If you're 22, obviously different things apply to you than if you're 16 or 17. But because this is a passage of male living, this is the point, the time, the period uh, during which you turn from a boy into a man. This is the point where you're you're going to see that your 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 shoulders are becoming manly, your profile, your chest, um, your voice will by, at this point become manly. You'll start being. Uh, wanting to to shave your face uh, every morning or maybe every fourth morning. But this is a time where really important things are happening. And even more importantly, it's a time when you have the ability to do things that will make a success of your life or, God forbid, a failure. In other words, I cannot stress this strongly enough. What your life is going to be like And I know that when you're 16, 
30 seems like forever. It seems like life is over at the age of 30. But uh, a little bit of intelligent thought will tell you that there's much more of your life from 23 onwards than there is between now and 23. And I cannot emphasize sufficiently that what your life will be like is really, really decided between the ages of 16 and 23. Now, uh, I, I'm, I'm sort of enjoying the Shakespeare uh, selection of those ages, but uh, it is true that you are already setting the course of your life before 16. Uh, I would actually say it probably goes to 13. That's probably really when it should be. So I'm sticking with Shakespeare 16 to 23. However, the truth is that it's a 10-year period from 13 to 23. That, that is really the 10 years that shape your life if you are a man. Again, uh, I hope to do a show for women between certain ages, but right now this show is specifically for males, all right? And uh, males, for, uh, for definitional purposes, are uh, human beings with penises. Let's just get that clear. I know <laughs> probably not a lot of people listening to the show who, who necessarily think otherwise, but I know full well that there are people, particularly on campuses, and seeing as I'm talking between the ages of 13 and 23, you might well be on a campus, if not a high school campus, a college campus, where uh, they make uh, completely false distinctions between sex and gender, and they suggest that there's a limitless... All right, enough of the nonsense. We haven't got time for all of that. This one, this show is for males. Uh, between the ages of 13 and 23. And I'm going to be speaking about a lot of very specific things. And I want you to understand that uh, although it may sound dogmatic, nothing that I'm saying is an all or nothing proposition. In other words, it's not that you have to do all of these things I'm going to be talking about on the show or else you don't stand a chance. That's complete nonsense. It's not how the world really works at all. Um, you know, imagine that uh, you hear uh, a survival expert saying, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of this because uh, somebody I know very well decided to uh, do a few days on the Appalachian Trail, and I'm recording this show in the winter time, <laughs> so... Uh, off this person went. There was actually two of them and their dog, and uh, they were going to spend three or four days hiking a section of the Appalachian Trail. And uh, happy to relate that they came home safely after one night because it was so bitterly cold and so unpleasant, and they were finding themselves so listless and so without energy. So imagine somebody says, in order to survive in the wild... If you're going to be doing the Appalachian Trail in February or January or March or whenever it is, uh, you need, A, you need a space blanket, you need a tent, you need a ground sheet, you need a foam mattress, you need 3,000 calories of food carrying with you per day, you need a pressurized camp stove that can function in sub-zero temperatures. You need lanterns. You need flares in case of emergency. You need a cell phone. You need a satellite locator beacon in case you run out of cell phone battery or you're out of cell phone reach and you need to be able to summon help. Uh, you need four layers of thermal clothing. You need rope. You need a hat. You need a walking stick. You need a compass. You need topographic maps. It's, you get the idea, right? And so somebody, let's say, for one reason or another, finds himself out on the trail, and he goes through the list I've just given you, and he's only got about a third of the things, and he says, well, I may as well call it quits. I'm not going to make it, because I heard Rabbi Daniel Lappin say that in order to survive in the wild, here's the list of things you need. No, it's not an all-or-nothing proposition. Ideally, 
it would be great if you had all these things. But, um, it, you know, you may not need 3,000 calories of food a day. Maybe you do well on 2,000, whatever it is. And maybe you don't have a satellite locator beacon, whatever. It doesn't matter. The more of these things you have, the better it is. Not all of them will be applicable, but the more you have, the better. It doesn't mean that if you don't have them all, you're doomed. And similarly, not everything I say is going to be applicable to everybody. And uh, even if it is, you're not all going to be able to do everything I'm talking about. I'm laying out, if you like, a mathematical ideal. I'm laying out what would be best. But as much of it as you can do helps. The more of it you do, the more of it you can make part of your life, the more successful will be this period of time till you're 23 years old and the more successful as a result of that will be the rest of your life all right so i hope that that makes sense by by way of introduction and uh, as soon as we come back we will launch right in to the material of of what what it is that uh, should happen during those 10 years between the ages of 13 and 23 uh, the um, the website, and again, I uh, every now and then I, I receive uh, a letter from a fan, a letter from a listener, uh, a lesson, a letter from somebody who uh, who who wants to communicate. And every now and then I get the same letter. It always reads the same way, it's, although it's not always from the same people, obviously. But it's always, you know, I'm finding the uh, messages in the show very uplifting and very valuable. But I always get put off at the end where you uh, you end up promoting your products and you then reduce the whole thing to nothing but a commercial message. Now, uh, today, because it's a busy show and I've got a lot to get across, I don't have time to go into why that is such wrong thinking and why it is that commercial information is incredibly valuable and why it is that uh, a message never gets diminished by a commercial connection, not in any way, shape or form. I've spoken about this before in earlier shows, but it so happens that I recently got another one of, of these letters, and I, I have a sort of standard response that I sent off to the person, but I'll also talk about it in, in one of the forthcoming shows soon. But uh, with, with that um, advisory out of the way, the website is rabbidaniellappin.com. And uh, here's what you want to do at that website. Number one, you want to make sure you are subscribed to Susan Lappin's Musings. It's called Susan's Musings. Now, we have other mailings as well, but I specifically want to draw your attention to Susan's Why, because I have noticed that all the mailings we do, we do a mailing of a thought tool every week, we mail an Ask the Rabbi every week, and we mail a Susan's Musings. And I've noticed that of all the mailings we do, the ones that attract the largest number of comments and letters that flow in, and you can read them all on the website at rabbidaniellappin.com, but the one that attracts by far and away the most comments is Susan's Musings. And uh, I'm not sure if it's because they're personal. Uh, they're, uh, you, you know, you can really hear her talking. It's very, very much her and uh, people seem to like that. And so if you're not aware of that, you need to go to rabbidaniellappin.com and make sure, number one, go and read back issues, back uh, copies of Susan's Musings, and number two, subscribe to make sure you do get it, and uh, that way you'll be able to enjoy it every single week. So uh, that is one thing you can do. The other thing you can do is read up about a product called Madam I'm Adam. And uh, this, uh, this, this audio program, it's a two-hour program on male-female relationships. And uh, the reason we called it Madam, I'm Adam is because, obviously, that phrase is a palindrome. And we joke that uh, when Adam opened his eyes after his divine anesthetic wore off, he looked at this bewitching creature standing before him, at that point naked, no less, and he stood up and took a bow, and he said, Madam, I'm Adam. 
and uh, we we like the palindromic aspects of it. It reads the same both ways because of the uh, duality, the 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 equation like quality of marriage, male and female, and uh, looking at it in terms of benefits in both directions. So anyway, all of this is in an audio program called Madam I'm Adam at Rabbi Daniel Lappin dot com. Read about it, and I think you will probably find that this is either useful for the stage of life you are at or else it's going to be incredibly useful for the stage of life somebody you care about is at. Anyway, all of that at RabbiDanielLappin.com and um, we will be back in just a moment. I usually begin by saying, well, hello, everybody. Hello, baby. We're back on the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show, where your rabbi reveals how the world really works. But I can't say that now, because it's not, hello, everybody. Uh, We have already said farewell uh, to all the women. And uh, not permanently. As a matter of fact, I am already working um, on a show for women. I've got one show for single women. I've got one show for women who are married. And I've got another show for women who have been married. And these are all different. And uh, one of the things we'll be doing is I'll be offering a public service there. I will be providing translation ability to people, to, to the women who hear the show. In other words, I will let them understand what men mean when they say certain things. But all of that lies ahead. For now, however, I am speaking to men between the ages of 13 and 23, that critical period of 10 years going by. And I also have to warn you that I will be speaking about sex. Yes, I will be speaking about male-female relationships, because it is quite impossible to convey any understanding at all of how the world really works, uh, ignoring male-female relationships. And so I will. Now, of course, um, it is awkward sometimes, if not all the time, for parents and children to speak about sex. Um, It's uncomfortable for the parents, and it's uncomfortable for the children. Uh, that discomfort is absent when you are together with your rabbi. Uh, The discomfort, of course, is very understandable. Look, uh, as you know, from an ancient Jewish wisdom perspective, uh, which is all that I know, the whole idea of sex is to build connectivity. Um, essentially, the the way a uh, a teacher of mine put it when I was but uh, thirteen or thereabouts was, he said, "You know, uh, you know, pretty soon you are going to start uh, going out and you're going to meet girls, and when you do, you are going to make a discovery." you are going to discover that when you go out with a girl, you're going to find yourself saying things like, where would you like to go? And you will realize that this is possibly the very first time in your entire life that you actually cared about the feelings of another human being. And there you are in classroom one, course 1A, that God put in place for proper living, by means of a male-female relationship. In other words, uh, the whole idea is to build connection and to care about other people. Now, as a matter of fact, in the actual sexual relationship, and again, this this is stuff deeply embedded in biblical thinking, uh, the, um, the, the focus, amazingly enough, is not on just, you know, it shouldn't be, just on the pleasure that you or the woman are getting from the experience and from the encounter, the reality is that each of you is deeply concerned that the other person is enjoying it, that the other person is comfortable and happy. That is a crucial part of it. 
And so uh, communication becomes essential. Men uh, are sometimes very uncomfortable with women who do not convey any kind of enthusiasm or any kind of uh, pleasure in the process. And women are incredibly frustrated with men who do not communicate emotionally. So again, a difference. Uh, Men want to know that women are communicating sexually. Women want to know that men are communicating emotionally. How you feel is important to express. Now, as I said during the first segment, there are going to be things here that may not be applicable to you, possibly because of your age. You may be a little younger, and you may uh, wonder. Uh, But on the other hand, my presumption is that you probably already know considerably more about male-female relationships than your closest relatives suspect. And uh, it is uncomfortable with closest relatives because uh, the the process that God put in place is a process that is designed to prepare a man and a woman to be a parent. Now, what is one of the things that you've got to know about being a parent? Well, you really have to care about the feelings of somebody else, namely your child. And, uh, and when the child is a baby, you've got to be very sensitive and aware of how the child is feeling and what the child is wanting and needing. And later on, as the child grows up and and eventually reaches even those ages of 10 years old to 23 years old, that is the focus of today's show, well, uh, it's there. Parents have to be incredibly aware and sensitive because very often their children aren't talking to them as much as they used to before that that time period. But uh, that sensitivity is brought about through the sexual relationship. It is a caring about the feelings of the other person. It is becoming really bound up with the other person. And all of this is uncomfortable for us to talk about with our parents. And it's uncomfortable for parents to talk about with their children. And partially it is, of course, because uh, no (laughs) no child wants to think about uh, what his parents did to bring him into the world. Right? You don't want to think about it. It's like too much information. And and parents are, of course, talking to their children are, are very aware of that. But look, uh, the reality is that this is exactly how God designed the world. And the reality is that you are here, and I am here for the same reason, and that is um, our two grandfathers took a really intense liking to two women. And they fell in love with them and they just wanted to be with them all the time and they wanted to be as close to them as they possibly could and they got married and uh, and that brought into the world your mother and your father and then at some point your mother and father ran into one another and your father asked your mother out because he really really liked her and what did he like first well he initially was struck by how she looked and uh, there it is it's that uh, divine sex drive that created a genuine bond between two human beings, the closest bond possible, a bond in which the two eventually even begin to think like one another, and nothing could be or have been a better preparation for them to bring you into the world. But obviously, it is and can be uncomfortable. Uh, And in case you you want to know how I teach my own children uh, about this area, uh, the way I do it is by teaching them Bible. And it doesn't take very long before what might be regarded by many as sensitive topics crop up and uh, and. I don't gloss over them. We go we go through them, and again on an age appropriate level. But uh, in each case, whether it's uh, Adam and Eve, or uh, much later on things that happened uh, between uh, Judah, one of Jacob's sons, and uh, and a woman. Uh, earlier on, things that happened between Lot and his daughters. All of these things are there as the best sex ed program the world has ever known. Now, I am really not an enthusiast of the way sex ed is conducted in GICs. And uh, 
and, and I don't mean to um, hurt your feelings if you happen to attend a GIC, which is uh, what I call a public school, is a government indoctrination camp. I don't mean to hurt your feelings on that, but in the real world, the way things are, uh, most people uh, of the age, of school-going age, K through 12, attend gigs. They just do. And that's fine as long as you are aware exactly of what is going on. You understand and you are conscious of the indoctrination process. And that brings us to step number one. Here you are, somewhere on that spectrum. You are male and you're between 13 and 23. Step number one, my friends, is you need to put together a a little small club or a mastermind group of like-minded contemporaries of yours, people of roughly your same age, also needless to say men as well, guys, and uh, you need to have this group. Uh, What for? Well, I'm going to explain in more detail, but you absolutely have to have a group like this for accountability and, and for strength. How many people should you have in this group? Well, Um, I tend to go with uh, King Solomon's view in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 4, verse 12. And look, I I really understand you may well be somebody who's never looked at a Bible in your life, and that's fine. But it's always helpful to know where the person you're in conversation with is coming from. And you and I are in conversation now, so you may want to know where it is I'm coming from. And uh, if you want to look that up, you might be interested in chapter 4, verse 12 of the book of Ecclesiastes, written by King Solomon. And again, this is this is really good advice. I mean, it doesn't matter whether it comes from King Solomon or whether it comes from Yoda or whether it comes from uh, the, the wise man of Gotham. It doesn't make any difference. But what King Solomon there says is that um, if somebody starts up with you, And um, by that he means not only a physical encounter from, shall we say, a bully or something like that. No, he's talking about even an idea. When an idea grapples with you, when an idea tries to take over your thinking, uh, when, uh, uh, when an appetite tends to take over, uh, it's very hard to combat. He says, however, it can be combated if you're not alone. If there are two of you, you can triumph over that one. And best of all is if there are three, because he says the threefold braided cord doesn't easily break. And um, and so I would say you, you need a minimum of three people in your club, in your mastermind group, your your little group of guys who look at the world similarly to you and who have similar goals and aspirations, goals and aspirations uh, to have the most successful life possible, to have the most options open to you when you hit the ripe old age of 23, the most options open. And so I would say uh, your little group, three, three guys up to five. I wouldn't go more than five. I wouldn't go under three. One or you know, one other guy, two other guys, two other guys. Perfect. That makes three of you. But uh, four other guys is five of you. Okay, fine. I'd leave it at that, and and I would not go any further than that. So uh, this is a group of guys, and it's it's not. This is is not going to be that easy to find, but. Um, you you really do need them because what you're up against, the challenges that are facing you, the things you have to achieve to get the most out of this period, and no matter where you are, you know, you might be 16, you might be 20, you might be 22, but if you're somewhere between th- uh, 13 and 23, it's not too late. Now is the time to find and form a little mastermind group, and where you find these guys uh, I can't tell you because I, I'm not sufficiently familiar with your particular situation. But as we go on through uh, today's show, you'll get a sense of what we need. And uh, what we're talking about is that um, there are going to be things you have to avoid. Look, it's very hard. Uh, I'm going to tell you that right up front. The challenges confronting you now are massive and significant. But uh, I I think that with the mastermind group and with the right guidance, you're up to it. And the 
tremendous difference that it makes in the future, uh, how you will enjoy your life, how you will live your life, what things will be like. And then again, I remind you, uh, there's much more of life from 23 onwards than there is from now to 23. So no matter how hard, you know, you might think of it as if uh, as if you're in the Marines. You're, 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 let's say you're 13 years old, you're signing up for a 10-year tour of duty in the toughest roughest boot camp but when you come out boy will you be a man so um uh we're going to now move on with uh what the first task of your mastermind group is and that's what we're going to do just as soon as we get back uh as usual i would like you to uh, take a look at the website I'd like to um, encourage you to make sure that you read um, some of the Ask the Rabbi questions on the website, read some of Susan's musings, and uh, you might even want to subscribe. You might even want to get these in your mailbox on a regular basis. All of that at rabbidaniellappin.com. The uh, product that is most relevant to the subject we're discussing today is a an audio program called Madam, I'm Adam. And the great thing is it's available for uh, digital download, meaning that um, you don't need a lot of patience, right? You, there are a lot of things I'm going to be talking about that you have to wait for till you're 23, not this. This one <laughs> you can get right away. Uh, it's called Madam, I'm Adam, the website rabbidaniellappin.com. Welcome, men. We're back on the Rabbi Daniel Lappin show. And yes, I say welcome, men. Uh, but uh, what about those of you who are 13 and 14 and 15? You know, surely you are boys? No. Not at all. Let me explain to you why that is. First of all, I will tell you that uh, the uh, Jewish people traditionally welcome boys into the uh, uh, congregation of men uh, when they're at the age of 13 years old. We call that a bar mitzvah. Now, to suppose that this was originally intended to be nothing other than a over-the-top, indulgent party with a life-sized effigy of the bar mitzvah boy carved in chopped liver. Uh, no, this is what modern American culture has made of what was actually a fairly serious initiation process. The fact is that nowadays, when the rabbi in the synagogue on the day of the boys' bar mitzvah usually begins his speech by saying, well, today you are a man, uh, he will have to give an accounting for that after 120 years for that shameless, sycophantic lie. Because I can assure you that the dribbling baby and the selfish narcissist standing in front of him with the accumulated wisdom of 13 years of being mollycoddled by his mommy, uh, is very, very far from a man. However, you, even if you are only 13, you have just signed up for the Marines. You've just joined the toughest, roughest boot camp. The next 10 years, you are engaged in building your life right now, 10 to 23, those 10 years. And so uh, as soon as you sign up for bootcamp, you're not a boy anymore. You are indeed a man. So that's why I say, welcome, men. We are ready to get to work. Now, I indicated in the previous uh, segment a very important program, your very first task, which is to start forming a mastermind group. Now, you may find that uh, you started off with only one guy. And then eventually uh, you are able to find a third guy who fits in, and that would be great. Um, You know, after a little while, the three of you might identify a fourth guy who'd be perfect. Sign him up. Now, it could also happen that one of the original members drops out. You know, he just can't take it. People drop out of the Marines. It happens. Well, what you do is you try and replace him and uh, try and bring the new member up to speed. 
But this uh, private club, uh, this little mastermind group, and it's not something that that you know gets talked about a lot. You you meet. You might have a uh, if you use a smartphone, you might have a WhatsApp uh, group on it or or, or a, an email group. Whatever it is, you will find the best ways. Uh, to communicate between the three of you or the four of you or the five of you, but hopefully not more than that. Why? What's what's happening? Why is this so important? Why is it absolutely indispensable? I, I would even recommend uh, you can stop the program right now for a few days or weeks until you've formed your little mastermind group because uh, you're going to need it for what comes next. Let me explain. Um, again, I... Uh, scoot back to scriptures. And again, look, this is something that uh, your um, drill sergeant at in the Marines could be telling you. Uh, it could be your rabbi telling you. It could be anybody telling you. But in my case, it happens to be King David, straight out of the book of Psalms, chapter 34, verse 14, uh, where King David says, turn away from evil and do good. Uh, why doesn't he say do good and turn away from evil? Because the first step in any boot camp is to stop making mistakes. And then you can start working on doing the right thing. So, for instance, let's say uh, you decide that you want to build up your body strength. And there are two things acting against it. One of them is that uh, you just don't do any exercise. You sit around watching television all the time when <laughs> that's what you do. That's a big problem. There's another big problem, and that is that uh, at every opportunity, you sneak down to the refrigerator and help yourself to a few more chocolate cream eclairs, you know, or whatever happens to be your weakness. And, uh, and so now, should you start exercising, uh, King David and me uh, would say no. First of all, turn away from evil. Stop doing the mistakes. Stop doing the things that are holding you back. And the reason is that if you don't tackle it in this direction, the likelihood is that you will begin to get discouraged because it's not going to work as smoothly as it can. Don't forget, you need small triumphs along the way. You need little victories along the way in with which to boost yourself and with which to encourage yourself. So um, the what are what are the turn aside things? A, a whole lot of really really tough things, and that's why I said don't even embark on this until you've got a mastermind group, until you've got uh, your group of friends um, with whom you can talk openly and say, you know, I'm I'm having uh, I'm having real trouble, and don't feel bad about this because each time you do that, you're encouraging the other guys to also open up and and draw on the full support that the group is capable of giving. And remember that, you know, one of the biggest challenges, and uh, uh, with, with God's help, you should never face this challenge, but one of the biggest challenges that people face, men more than women, is alcoholism, an addiction to alcohol. And uh, uh, without a lot of time spent on, on why that is. I will just point out, you've heard the word spirits for alcohol. Sometimes in some stores, they have shelves uh, marked uh, wines, and then they've got some more shelves marked spirits. And those are, you know, uh, whiskeys, brandies, vodkas, and, and all those other distilled things. Well, uh, the original name for alcohol was spiritus. That was the Latin name that the early monks gave it. And the reason was they recognized that alcohol satisfied a spiritual yearning, not a physical yearning. Now, after a while, it can become a physical addiction. But the reason that men will sometimes turn to alcohol is because, well, it's not, I, I don't want to overstate this, but it makes sense for me to tell you that it has to do with having misspent the the years from 10 to 23. <laughs> That's really, really what it is. But basically, uh, when men feel bitter, they feel their lives are wasted, when they feel they're not doing what they should be doing, alcohol dulls the pain. It's a spiritual salve. And uh, the struggle against alcohol is tremendously difficult. And smart people know that it cannot be accomplished without friends. It can't be accomplished without a group. And in fact, they even have a name for the group. It's called Alcoholics Anonymous or AA. And many, many other groups have been built on the model 
of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, uh, and the idea, once again, is you have to have somebody to phone or text or contact when you're feeling yourself dragged down, when you're feeling yourself pulled in the direction of something that you've already decided. And this is a battle between head and body, right? It's a battle between, I sometimes say, between head and heart. Your heart is pulling you to do something. Your head is saying, this is not what I want to do. That's the time you need to contact your version of Alcoholics Anonymous, your mastermind group, because uh, the heart pulls. You know, uh, Woody Allen, who is a, a brilliant filmmaker, I mean, he's really very talented, but he's also not a very successful human being. He's a successful filmmaker, not a successful human being, and uh, made a lot of bad mistakes in his life. But at one of the times of mistakes where he was involved in a sexual relationship with a woman he should not have been engaged in, people said to him, what are you thinking? You know, how did you do it? What, 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 what happened to you? And he said to them, uh, he shrugged his shoulders and he said, the heart wants what the heart wants. And it's, you know, it's a sad response. He's basically saying, my head couldn't control me. Uh, my heart wants what it wants. And that's true, right? The heart wants what it wants. We know that. But what we're talking about is how to build up enough strength to um, make sure that the head rules what you do, not the heart. I mean, that's the, that's the crux. That's the key part of it. And, uh, and I will tell you that even later on when it comes to uh, professional success at work, at, uh, at training, at education – the biggest problem, and, and this is the separation. I mean, if you look at uh, uh, men who are making a success of their lives and men who aren't, one of the enormously significant distinguishing features is self-discipline. Self -dis In other words, are you capable of running your body on the basis of what your head says, not on the basis of what your heart says? And... Uh, I, I, again, I can't emphasize this enough. That is one of the chief tasks you have awaiting you during the 10 years, 13 to 23, building up self-discipline, training yourself to do what the head says, not what the heart wants. Because we all know the heart wants what the heart wants, and it's usually not good for you. I'm not saying there's never a time for heart. In romantic relationships, there's a tremendous role for heart in uh, in uh, giving compassion, in sharing, in, in helping people. Of course, there's a role for heart. But in governing the course of your life, the way you follow your map through life, the way you achieve the kind of life you want to, the way you want to be at the starter's pad at the age of 23, you need to work on self-discipline. And uh, nothing is more helpful at this point than having your group with whom you can uh, immediately connect when you find the heart wanting what the heart wants and the head is losing the struggle. You reach out for your lifeline. You reach out for your mastermind group. And uh, what is one of the, the first things? We'll start with, with simpler ones. One of the first things is passive activities. I'm not even going to call them activities. They're pacifists. <laughs> They're passive things. Uh, predominantly, what am I talking about? Uh, watching stuff. Watching stuff. Now, I'm not including reading in this, okay? Uh, reading is very different. Conversation with people is very different. I'm specifically talking about watching video, watching movies, watching entertainment, video games. And again, I, I'm not going to say nothing at all, but if you happen to have a problem in this area, uh, what you should do is give yourself a month of zero. In other words, let's say you recognize that like many men of your age, uh, you have a tendency to spend too much time watching YouTube, uh, TV, video, whatever it is, sitting and watching a screen. Too much time doing that. You recognize that. All right. Uh, you set yourself the task along with your mastermind group one month with nothing, nothing at all. And then when that terribly difficult month, which, by the way, will get easier and easier as it goes through, after that, you can spring back to a, no a normality, if you like, you know, an occasional thing. It's exactly the same way as, uh, you know, people, there are many people who uh, smoke 
too much. Now, I know that it is, um, it's, it's common to say no smoking at all. And the truth is that that is probably best. But if, if somebody wanted to uh, get himself from you know, 40 cigarettes a day to two cigarettes a day, and there's no question that medically that's vastly superior, um, the, the way to do that is to try and go a month with nothing at all and then go back to two a day uh, or whatever it is he wants to do. Here as well, good thing to try and take it all the way, complete cold turkey. Uh, passive activity, not good for you in a number of different ways. But uh, chief of all, um, reducing imagination. And imagination is incredibly important for your future because without imagination, you simply cannot envisage a future beyond what you can see. And this is one of the most destructive uh, things that shackle people to their destructive present lives. They lack the ability to see anything different. For that, you need imagination. And watching things with your eyes, shows, video games, all of that absolutely obliterates your capacity for imagination. Secondly, it ruins your self-discipline because it's passive. You're not doing anything. You are yielding to laziness. It is, after all, most comfortable to just lie back and watch something. And uh, we sometimes fool ourselves into thinking, well, we're doing something with video games. We're building up our reflex. No, don't fool yourself. Right? This is basically a passive activity. Even if your adrenaline does flow and... Uh, and so that would be step one for your mastermind group. Train one another, help one another, uh, overcome passive activities. Now, uh, that is the uh, King David's turn away from evil, right? Stop doing that. But what's the doing good? Well, you can figure out the doing good uh, alternative to that is uh, physical activity, uh, working out building up your body, building up your speed, your balance, your athleticism, building up your strength. These are really useful things. And, and apart from anything else, the entire process of subjecting your body to the pain and the grueling work of a workout also helps to build up self-discipline because what you're dealing with is the ability to, to, to control your body. And you're going to be wanting to do that with every appetite your body has. You're going to be wanting to do it with the tendency towards laziness. All of these things have to do with becoming a man. And that is the boot camp that you are currently engaged on. Um, so, quick uh, quick pause. We're going to uh, visit the website at rabbidaniellappin.com. Make sure you read Susan's musings because uh, that is life from a woman's perspective. And uh, and my wife is a uh, a very uh, well. I, I'm not. I don't have to sing her praises. And now at this point, although I, I do frequently, not only to other people, but most importantly to her as well, I, I really try to never miss an opportunity to express to her how much I appreciate her, how much I admire her. And, uh, and, and part of it is because of how she's able to uh, look at the world as a woman and at the same time make a case that is compelling for whatever argument she wants to make. All of that is on Susan's musings, which you can see at rabbidaniellappin.com. And as I said, the comments to the musings I find almost as interesting as her musings themselves. People do seem to really uh, like speaking um, about to one another and also I mean basically the comment sections of Susan's musings always full at rabbidaniellappin.com Good evening uh, America and welcome aboard Apollo 13 It may not be Apollo 13 but it is the Rabbi Daniel Lappin show where your rabbi well in general reveals how the world really works but uh, in this particular show revealing how the world really works, particularly with respect to men between the ages of 13 and 23. Yes, I know William Shakespeare, as I pointed out at the beginning of the show, uh, makes the number 16 to 23, and, th and that's fine. But the truth is that one should really uh, sign up for this boot camp a little bit before 16. 13 would be ideal. And another thing I want to point out is that 
uh, please be aware that I am not paying any attention or giving any heed whatsoever to cultural norms. Um, in other words, today in conversation, and I, I will be honest with you in this respect, I don't particularly enjoy speaking on college campuses. Um, I have done it most recently. I spoke um, at Kenyatta College in Northern California, San, near San Francisco, and needless to say, there were huge protests. Uh, what occasioned the protests? Uh, they put out posters around the campus saying that uh, Rabbi Daniel Lappin is a homophobe, a misogynist, an Islamophobe, and a capitalist. And uh, it was uh, needless to say they disrupted the speech. We somehow we managed to work around that. We moved to another auditorium, and uh, I I pointed out that you know they weren't a hundred percent wrong. Uh, in terms of being an Islamophobe, well, kind of yes. You know, when I'm in a public area, particularly anywhere in Europe or uh, in the Middle East, uh, if I'm on an airplane and I'm nervous or worried about uh, some kind of violent incident, who am I thinking of? Quakers? Members of the LDS Church? You know, Buddhists? No. I am scared of Islam, absolutely. If you want to, you want to, you want to denigrate me as, as an Islamophobe. I think that's going a bit far, but at least there's something to it. Misogynist. I don't like women. Um, come on, <laughs> I'll uh, leave aside the fact that I'm blessed with six daughters and a wonderful wife. But um, no, misog I don't even have to dignify that with a response. A homophobe, scared of homosexuality, um, scared of what it can do to our culture, um, scared of what it does to men. Yeah, sort of, I suppose, but not scared of individuals or, uh, you know, individuals is, is a different thing. It's, it's the practice, not the person. And uh, capitalist, uh, they said I'm a capitalist. As well. well, yeah, guilty. No question about it. Uh, there are a number of things that crop up like this when you speak on a campus. One of them is that in the question and answer session, sometimes a student will get up and start their question with the words, I'm offended. And I immediately say, look, that could not be more irrelevant. The fact that you're offended in no way automatically indicts my comments. Uh, maybe I did say something false, in which case you're wrong to be offended, or maybe I said something rude and hurtful, in which case maybe, yes as well, maybe, although I'm not sure in an educational institution. But uh, the fact that you're offended in and of itself might mean nothing more than you're overly thin-skinned and you take offense too easily. So please stop starting a question by saying, I'm offended. Uh, sometimes people will uh, start a question by saying, uh, what you said was racist. And I immediately respond. I said, look, I'm sorry, but that's totally undefined. That word is meant to silence anybody who disagrees with you. So I reject that completely. Um, anything with the word ist at the end, you're a racist or even anti-Semite. Sometimes, as ludicrous as it sounds, I've been accused of being an anti-Semite. I dismiss it. I said, look, if you wish to debate on the merits of the argument, tell me what I said that isn't correct, but don't give me a label. I reject it entirely. It's meaningless. It's ill-defined and nonsensical. It's not. It's anti-intellectual. Anyway, I tell you all of this so as you understand that I am not uh, making any allowances for cultural trends. People will sometimes, that's sexist. Um, you know what? Suck it up. I'm sorry. Just grow up and understand that not everybody agrees with you. There are different viewpoints. My viewpoint I'm giving now is rooted in the longest longitudinal study of human nature ever undertaken. I call it the 2,000 years of Judeo-Christian tradition. And, um, and when uh, archaeologists or historians look back on the later years of the 20th century and the early years of the 21st, I think that if Western civilization has survived, which I hope it does, I think historians will say, what were they thinking? Were they crazy? What, what was with them? What did they think? That's what, that's what I suspect will, will happen. But uh, 
please understand that uh, I'm going to be saying things that are that, that would not go down well in uh, polite circles and polite society. And it's up to you to decide which is a better guide to reality, what I'm saying or what the culture is saying out there. Uh, so, you know, by, by way of, of disclaimer, I am fully aware that everything or most things I say are completely at odds with the message that will be beamed at you by your entertainment, by your educational institutions, by many of your friends, although not the friends in your selected mastermind group, needless to say. But um, it is going to be uh, common out there. So be aware. of it. So, for instance, I'm going to say that uh, I believe you should be having in mind the idea that you will get married in your early 20s. All right. The way I see it, you graduate from boot camp at 23 and uh, you go ahead and get married uh, that 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 same year. You go. Now, I, people are going to have trouble with that. And that's all right. Like I said earlier, it's not a uh, an all or nothing proposition. I'm laying out the principles and there may be many reasons why for you getting married at 21 makes sense. There may be reasons for you that may, getting married at 28 makes sense, right? I respect your intelligence and your ability to think with your head and not with your heart. So, uh, but again, in laying out the uh, permanent principles, I, I say, yeah, you should be thinking of getting married at 23. Absolutely. It makes perfect sense. Uh, why? Well, f apart from anything else, uh, you know, do people have such a wonderful time going through the, the dating years and having serial relationships, having this deep, intense relationship with somebody and then breaking up six months or a year or two years or in horrible situations three years later? where you've wasted three years of a girl's life. Why do I say wasted three years of a girl's life? Because most girls want to get married, as well they should. And uh, most girls recognize that their, okay, um, political correctness warning. <laughs> All right, I don't, I don't really have to issue warnings. I'm not going to. But um, uh, girls start off with uh, very high value, and year by year, that diminishes. Now, uh, I'm, I'm happy that I encouraged women to turn off and not to listen to this show because this can be hurtful, and I don't want it to be. I, I really sympathize, but this isn't me. This is the way we were created. This is nature. The fact is that, um, uh, you know, imagine a, uh, a guy getting married at 23. Would he rather marry a 19 or 20-year-old or a 29 or 30 year old it's not even a question now i know there are many women who say well i don't want to be married for my looks i, I want to be married for the total but okay fine i'm not going to waste any time on all of that that's the stuff we hear out there and i i don't feel i have to uh, accommodate to it uh, bottom line is that um uh, for girls, the, the passage of time is serious. If the goal is to be married and to have a family, which is what it is for most women, although, again, many women think it's okay to uh, waste their um, late teens and early 20s in a sequence of, of unsatisfactory love affairs and uh, sequential makeups and breakups and hookups and breakdowns, and then finally, find a nice guy to marry when they're 25 or 26 or 27. Well, I am telling nice guys or nice men, you guys, I'm telling you, don't look at that girl. You can do better because you are a man and you are a graduate of the toughest boot camp in the whole world. This one right here. You do not have to have a girl who has been damaged by all of those affairs and don't for one moment think that she isn't but I'll probably come back to that in a little while uh, for now however um, understand that I'm going to be um, moving on to some of the other things you want to be able to avoid remember I said from uh, the book of Psalms chapter 34 verse 14 turn away from evil 
and then do good. Uh, we spoke about passive activities. Um, I want to speak about the cultural message. You've got to be able to turn away from the cultural message. You've got to be able to develop the courage and self-confidence. Self-confidence, critical. Uh, you've got to have the self-confidence to be able to say, uh, I'm sorry, I don't care if everyone's saying that. I'm, I don't care if they try to shame me into buying into it. It's a lie. The, the message is false. I'm not going there. So building up your strength to resist the cultural message. The cultural message you're going to hear is that uh, patriotism and the whole concept of the nation state are obsolete. Uh, we, you know, as Marx said, workers of the world unite. He didn't say Americans of the world unite or Russians of the world unite. Uh, the International was their song. Their John Lennon sang, imagine, you know, there are no boundaries and no nations. That's what they really believe, to recognize that your family is important, your nation is important, your country is important. Uh, your religious family, your faith family, these connections are very important. Um, that's part of the cultural message. Ignore all of that. It's just the individual, or else they'll tell you, you know, that it's identity politics. Uh, you must identify as a this or as a that. Hostility to capitalism, hostility to making money, hostility to the free market, that's part of a cultural message. Toxic masculinity, that's another big one, right? That to be a man is something is somehow wrong. You are hearing from me precisely the reverse, that being a man, being masculine. Yes, and that does mean sometimes suppressing feelings. It does mean that sometimes you don't go crying to mommy. Sometimes it does mean that pain is suppressed. A stiff upper lip is maintained. Yes, it does mean all of those things. And if those things are masculine, yes, we want to see more of it. We have to reject the cultural message that masculinity is wrong and evil and terrible. Uh, do not buy into the notion that uh, all women want is equality. And uh, no, that isn't true. What most women want is a man they can look up to, a man of self-confidence, a man of morality, a man of honor, and a man who is masterful and in control. You have to become that man. Um, other things to avoid, and all of these things are, are tough to do. I'm, I'm obviously building up to the hardest one, but um, if you thought these are hard, wait. Um, Self-destructive behavior, right? There's, there's a whole lot of that. Uh, risky behavior, behavior that uh, involves drugs and alcohol. I, I don't have to spend any time telling you why those are destructive. All I have to say is that there will be intense social pressure. Uh, whether it's marijuana, if you happen to live in a state where it's becoming legal and there are marijuana stores, uh, you are going to be subjected to a lot of pressure. Uh, do we have to spend time on what's wrong with marijuana? The truth is that uh, on the overall, I'm not sure. It may not be terror. I don't know. I don't know if all the information is in, but I do know you need to keep away from it. Uh, why? Because it is an indulgence. It is a yielding of the body to your discipline. Uh, it is an undisciplined kind of thing to do. It's sort of sliding into a, a world that is not a world of reality. We're focusing very much on keeping yourself locked into a world of reality. And so uh, drugs and alcohol, you really are going to have to depend on your friends. You're going to depend on that little mastermind group as they will depend on you to avoid that. Now, it doesn't mean these are the only people you socialize with, which is exactly my point. You will find yourself among people who engage in destructive behavior. Other destructive behavior, driving dangerously. Uh, look, I understand you are a male. I understand you are between the ages of 13 and 23. And I understand why insurance companies rate you as the highest risk. And they are right to do so. Um, the all destructive activity in, in, in America is carried out, well, a whole lot of it, by people of, of your gender and age group. 
uh, bungee jumping, right? It would be out of business as an entertainment form, as an attraction, if there were no male. If Shakespeare was right and every male between the ages of 16 and 23 went to sleep, there'd be no bungee jumping. Uh, all self-destructive activities, for the most part, you are going to feel that same pull and that same urge to engage in high-risk behavior. Don't do it. Why? Because the downside is too high. You know, people can sometimes say, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to take a flyer. I'm going to buy some cryptocurrency. How much are you going to put into it? I, I'm going to put in $500. How much money do you have in savings? I got $150,000. You're going to put $500 into cryptocurrency? God bless you. Take a flyer. But isn't it risky behavior? Sure it is. But the risk-reward there is okay, because if you lose it all, not terrible. The reward may be good, no problem. Jumping out of an airplane with a parachute, okay, I know that it's only every few months that you hear of a parachute not, <laughs> not opening, but the downside isn't worth it, right, for the, for the adrenaline rush. That's what I'm talking about. Depend on your mastermind group to avoid the need for an adrenaline rush. It's the same as alcohol. It's the same as drugs. It is a spiritual rush which you could get from exerting yourself physically and from self-discipline. You get a very similar rush as well. Uh, motorcycle riding. I'm not going to tell you to never ride a motorcycle because I think it's an unreasonable request for to ask a male between the ages of 13 and 23. And hey, if you don't have any yen for motorcycling, fantastic. God bless you. Don't do it. But if you are going to do it, know where that there's traffic. Don't for one moment dream of riding a motorcycle in an urban area. Do not dream of riding a motorcycle on a road where there are trucks or where there's other traffic or where there's fast-moving cars. Don't even dream of it. Uh, you want to ride a motorcycle, go far out into the country and ride it there. One of the best, in, if you are a motorcyclist, you, you want to buy a motorcycle, do not buy one without buying a trailer to put behind your car. So you can take your motorcycle out into the country far away, ride it where the, uh, your, the likelihood of a mishap is low. And if there is a mishap, in all probability, there's a very good chance of walking away from it because no other vehicles are involved. Now, that doesn't mean to say always. Unfortunately, motorcyclists do hit trees. So if you can avoid it, fabulous. If you have to, nowhere where there are other vehicles at all. Um, stay away from things that even are remotely criminal. Um, even an, uh, a seemingly small and innocuous item on your record, you don't need this right now. You just don't need it at all. So definitely to be avoided. And, uh, uh, and just, you know, again, this is all just part of risk reward, uh, risk management, just making sure you ask yourself at times, is this something my head approves of? Or is this something I'm being talked into by friends? Or is it something I just, I feel like the rush, I feel like the excitement. I don't want to let my friends down. No, it's okay to be able to say to friends, sorry, I don't do that. Okay, I'm not going into a discussion or why, I'm not going to tell you my philosophy. You guys do whatever you want. I'm not even going to judge you, but I do judge myself. I don't do that. I don't know of a better way of dealing with these kinds of situations. Uh, the um, hardest one coming right up as soon as we come back. Meanwhile, the website, rabbidaniellappin.com. A whole lot to read about on the website. And also, I want you to read about an audio program. It's two hours of instruction. Uh, Bible-based instruction called Madam, I'm Adam. It's how the first two chapters of Genesis reveal pretty much everything you need to know about male-female relationships. All of that at rabbidaniellappin.com. Hasta la vista. Welcome to Jurassic Park. Hello, men. We're back, and uh, it may not be Jurassic Park, but monsters do lurk. No question about it. And the monsters we are talking about, uh, well, it's pornography. It's as simple as that. It is, uh, um, it is omnipresent. Uh, it is, I believe, one of the highest revenue-producing dark corners of the Internet. Enough said. It's out there. 
And um, it's also been normalized. You can actually hear celebrities talking about their consumption of pornography. So the danger here is the normalization of it. The danger is the implication that uh, this is nothing, it's no big deal. Uh, there was actually a Surgeon General of the United States uh, serving President Bill Clinton, which probably gives you some idea, if you uh, remember your history of that period, um, who uh, lost her job for encouraging masturbation. Okay, so, um, folks, gentlemen, I should say, here it is. It's um, uh, not worth spending a lot of time on other than to say this will probably be one of the most urgent usages to which you will put your mastermind group, to which you will turn to your mastermind group for help. Um, the the urge is powerful and compelling. I mean, we're talking about the sex urge. Uh, the fact that human beings are, are still on the planet and that our numbers continue to grow uh, the fact that even in tough times and bad times, uh, the fact is that we have to recognize that uh, for men, uh, which we are, this is an incredibly powerful urge. The amount of self-discipline needed to keep it under control is absolutely enormous. Please do not buy into the culture that uh, you can't help it because you have a sex addiction, right? Again, this is a very common way of talking. And again, I am not diminishing the, uh, the role of addiction, but I am saying that along with self-discipline and along with the help of your mastermind group, men, you can triumph. You can overcome. Um, why should you do so? Well, uh, the answer is that uh, you are looking to gear yourself up for a successful life. A successful life means marriage and family, and it means money, both of those two things. Well, it so happens that both those things are seriously undermined by the time wasted on pornography, and even more importantly, the actual damage that it does do. It impacts your progress towards these two goals. Right? So um, there is enough research available that I, I don't have to spend time, and you, you don't need me to spend time proving these points and referring you to studies because you all have access to Google and it's simply not hard to find the information that is reliable, the information that is serious, and uh, the information that is not meant to undermine morality as its primary purpose. And heaven knows there's enough of that out there as well to be aware of that. So um, uh, the, the, the thing you've got to ask yourself, and uh, again, counterintuitive, um, contrary to politically correct thinking. None of that matters. Uh, the bottom line is that the question you have to ask yourself is, is this activity that I'm engaged in bringing me closer to a good marriage and closer to being able to make money? Right? And the answer in this case obviously is no. Um, having to do with marriage, I have to speak about something here which, again, um, would be awkward for your parents to tell you in the same way that you will one day find it awkward to tell to your children. But when the time comes, I know you will probably find a way of, of making sure they have this information, as I am making sure you have it now. The information is, gentlemen, that you really want to marry a virgin. Now, there are a lot of jokes about this. Oh, you can't find any virgin. It's all, of, all of that coarseness out there in the culture uh, is something you just have to be aware of and put out of mind. Uh, you want to marry a virgin. Really? Why? Because it makes God happy? No, because it's going to make you happy. Uh, the fact is that uh, the way the good Lord created us, the way our biology works, 
Let me put it this way. In various cultures around the world, we have found cultures in which polygamy works. One man married to more than one woman works. Not recommending it. Uh, no matter how much of a man you succeed in becoming. No, not suggesting it. But it works. It's feasible. It can happen. And um, I've actually encountered it. It can happen. It's um, as long as everybody is part of the same way of thinking, uh, it actually can work fairly well. I actually heard one second wife say, uh, I love the fact that when I have an emergency at work early in the morning, my co-wife is going to make sure my kids are, have a good breakfast and are ready for school. I know that sounds bizarre and otherworldly, but yes, it, it can work. However, polyandry, no society has ever been found to exist with one woman and more than one man. Bottom line, uh, men are jealous about their wives and appropriately so, right? Your wife wants to know that you care about her, that she's more special to you than any other woman on the planet. And my point here is that um, when if nobody would like, in fact, uh, it's it, 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 there are even legal understandings of what's called a crime of passion. When a man finds his wife with another man uh, and he kills the other man, there is uh, some degree of latitude, not, not in our legal system and less and less today, but for many, many years that was called a crime of passion. There was some understanding that Men knew that if you slept with a married woman, you were running the risk of being killed, and there was a possibility that your murderer would get away with it, because it was considered to be so unbelievably serious, because every man, uh, including lawyers and judges, could put themselves in the position of that kind of marital betrayal. Nobody, but nobody, wants to think of their wife with another man. Now, you might say, well, today enlightened men understand that their wives will have been with plenty. I'm not paying any attention to today's enlightened thinking. I'm telling you of how the good Lord created you and what you really deep down will find to be the ways you feel. Uh, the fact is that you will have a much better marriage if you know that your wife kept herself for you. And... It is, there's no dual standard on this. There's no double standard. Yes, I know that there is no male version of the word slut. I understand that. Uh, player, fine. Bottom line is if you expect your wife to be a virgin, then you are going to want to do the same thing. You're going to want to keep yourself for marriage, which is why I'm going to discourage dating. Now, you're in this age group, right? Because everyone else has turned off, right? There are no women listening. Uh, there's nobody older than 23. There's no one listening younger than 13. And, um, and so it's okay for me to tell you that I am going to discourage dating. Courting is something different. In other words, when the time comes to start choosing a bride, then the time comes to start choosing a bride. But the idea of dating indefinitely as a leisure activity, going out with a girl, uh, regardless of whether or not she could be the one, going out with her for a lengthy period of time, using up valuable months and years of her life. No, uh, you're not going to be doing that, men. You're just not going to be doing that. You're going to be courting at the appropriate time. You're not going to be dating. And uh, when it's time for you to court, you're going to want to court women who uh, have not slept with other guys before. Uh, you are going to want to have the moral legitimacy to make that requirement, to make that demand of your social life because of the self-discipline you've imposed, not only in terms of sexual relationships, but even, yes, even in terms of pornography. It isn't easy. But uh, I told you at the outset, this 10-year boot camp program, the hardest thing out there, it makes the Marines look like child's play. 
I don't think it makes for for good show listening for me to cite study after study after study, particularly since, uh, you know, unlike 30 years ago, 20 years ago, today it's so easy to find all this material. Uh, What am I referring to? The fact that uh, there are studies and they are so reliable and so unpopular. (laughs) Uh, they're easy to find, but I mean, they've, they've even made the popular press. I found them, uh, various newspapers like the British Daily Mail have published them, but many, many others, uh, which is that uh, marriages where the wife um, has never slept with anyone else except her husband are reported to be happier. And I know that happy reports are, are somewhat subjective, so they're not as valuable as the next thing I'm going to tell you, which is uh, durability. Uh, the the likelihood of divorce climbs rapidly with every sexual partner your wife has had before you. Now, it's not an inevitability, and uh, obviously people work on their marriages. What I am telling you is that we're talking about the way to spend the years from 13 to 23 Uh, in order to launch your life at 23 in the most successful and happy way possible, you want to marry a virgin. And don't believe the uh, the uh, material out there where people, oh, there aren't any, you know, ev- the average American woman has had so and so many relationships. Don't, you don't have to believe all that stuff, number one. Number two, you don't have to marry an American woman. <laughs> so uh, you really can depart from the statistics. But the, the reality is, and it makes perfect sense, by the way. I mean, I, I've read an awful lot in this stuff. I've really delved deeply into it. And uh, I wouldn't tell you something that you could disprove so easily and dismiss what I'm saying. What I'm telling you is absolutely reliable. Uh, Your marriage happiness and durability, the strength of your marriage, the ability of your marriage to sustain tough times, the ability of your marriage to go through challenging periods and come out on top, all of that enormously assisted if you marry somebody who has not been with other men before. And... uh, Obviously, as I say, you keeping yourself subject to the same form of discipline adds to your moral legitimacy. In other words, as you can well imagine, uh, it, it is a little bit harder to say to a woman, look, I, I, re- I know this is an awkward topic, but uh, I really do need to know. And, you know, it's, at some point you say this, not on the first date or not on the first meeting, but somewhere on the way you say it. And, uh, you know, and she, she, she might say, well, uh, yeah, you know, I am I am a virgin, but like, what about you? If you at that point cannot say me too, uh, the the dynamic has shifted a bit. Not fatally, not fatally, but you're ahead of the game. You are way ahead of the game if you can actually enter the relationship in that kind of a way. So uh, now you might be thinking, I just spoke about the statistics about the uh, the woman having had previous partners. As that number climbs, uh, the likelihood of divorce climbs dramatically. It's, it's shocking. Uh, it's shocking what an incredibly significant factor this is. Um, by the way, living together, having sex with your spouse before marriage, not Uh, as dangerous as having sex with somebody other than the man you married, um, but still adding to the divorce risk. Isn't that funny? People would say, oh, I took her for a dress test drive. You know, we tried it out. Makes marriage less likely, not more likely. Again, understandable because of the, uh, you're not building up the commitment. All of these things you can, you're smart enough to figure out for yourself. You can research for yourselves. But yes, um, previous partners on the part of the man also uh, hurts the marriage. We're talking about the most successful life. My friends, if at the age of 25 you are married and you don't have money worries, and it's because of this course, you owe me a great big thank you because you got a good life at that point. A great marriage and no money worries? And we'll come to Money Worries coming right back in just a moment. The website, rabbidaniellappin.com. 
and uh, you probably, if, if you're finding this material useful, you probably also want to listen to the program, the audio program called Madam, I'm Adam, Decoding Marriage Secrets from Eden. Read more about it at rabbidaniellappin.com and uh, also read my wife Susan's materials called Susan's Musings. All of that at rabbidaniellappin.com. Back with you in a Nature, moment. Mr. Allnut, is what we are put in this world to rise above. And yes, that was Catherine Hepburn speaking to Humphrey Bogart in a 1951 movie called African Queen. Nature, Mr. Allnut, is what we were put in this world to rise above. And gentlemen, that is precisely what we're talking about. If, um, if you were going to have a, an imaginary clubhouse for your mastermind group, for your club, of like-minded men who are going to strengthen one another and be accountable to one another and help one another achieve the goal of succeeding in this 10-year boot camp from from 13 to 23, then this clubhouse should have above its door the saying, nature is what we were put in this world (coughs) to rise above. Don't let anybody tell you it's perfectly natural. Um, I most recently heard this in the context of masturbation. It's perfectly natural. Animals do it as well. Yeah, that's right. They probably do. That doesn't mean it's for human beings. Human beings are meant to rise above nature. Let me be absolutely clear what, what is natural. You know what's natural? Obesity is natural. Laziness and lethargy are natural. A clutter and chaos in your life, in your workplace, uh, in your bedroom. Clutter and chaos, perfectly natural. You know what else is natural? Rust, decay, peeling paint, weeds in the garden. All of that is natural. You stand athwart nature. You hold out your hands and say, halt, no further. I'm here to stop the process of nature. Debt, having debt. Yeah, that's natural. Doesn't mean you should do it. Fighting your nature is what we're talking about. Fighting nature is what this whole program is all about. Yes, of course, there are things that your nature will call you to do. You are a man and you're between the ages of 13 and 23. Of course, there are things that nature urgently summons you to do. But we're the men who control with our heads, not with our hearts. And that is of paramount importance. We have to say to ourselves all along, will this activity give me better marriage? Will it give me better money? Um, I spoke earlier about sitting around and playing video games or watching movies and videos. Uh, Will that give you a better marriage? Probably not. Uh, Will it do anything for your money-making ability? Absolutely not. It runs down your imagination. It lowers your ability to communicate. Now, reading helps your ability to communicate. And that is the next point I wanted to make. Uh, With your mastermind group, please give yourselves the target of reading. Basically, you're going to add to your mastermind group, your special men's club, Uh, you are going to add the the task of book reading. You are going to set yourselves a book to read, uh, something you all agree on, and you're going to set yourselves a time to finish it. Reading is incredibly powerful for developing your communicative ability. And for making money, your most important organ is your mouth, you know, unless you're going to be a swimsuit model uh, or something like that, right? But um, if otherwise... Your ability to communicate is your most important money-making tool. And so you are going to encourage one another in your mastermind group to read. And uh, being able to read a book together and discuss it, really, really important. By the way, I mean, I know that in today's day we think of virtual friends, right? How many friends do you have on Facebook? Forget all of that stuff. 
um, this mastermind group, if you absolutely have to, if you're living far away from other people and you have no choice but for these friends to be online, for these friends to be digital, electronic friends, and the only way to communicate them with that way, okay, if that's the only way, it's better than nothing. And even then, please make sure you use the telephone more than you use texting and, e and email. But ideally, these are people, these are men you can meet with physically once a week. Okay, please try your hardest as much as possible to build a group of between three and five of you that actually meets once a week. And uh, one of the things you'll do at that meeting is actually discuss the book you are reading together, the book you're all working on. Please uh, take this very, very seriously. It's important and uh, adds an enormous amount to your money-making ability. Now, uh, I've told you before that you're going to have to stand together, shoulder to shoulder with your fellow men to uh, to resist the cultural message that money isn't important and that making money mean, identifies you as greedy and evil and bad and wanting money is a bad thing and capitalism and the marketplace is bad and that employers are bad and and companies and business. This is the message you're going to get all the time that Government is good. Business is bad. The only way business can be good is if there is enough government regulation. Okay. Again, not going into a political discussion on that now, but know that the culture has gone so overboard in that direction that uh, we can move comfortably way over to the other end of the spectrum. No, regulation bad. I understand not all regulation is bad. Some regulation needed. They are, they are, they are bad uh, practices out there. I get that. But right now, the mood is so far over to the end of government good, regulation good, business bad. Move back. Just move way back and um, feel comfortable with that. Now, is making money the most important thing? You're not going to catch me out with that simple device. Of course, I'm not going to say that money is more important than faith. If that were so, I would eat non-kosher food, which is less expensive than kosher food. No, of course, I'm not going to say that. But I am going to say that it's up there almost parallel. Not saying it's of equivalent importance, but I'm saying you have to be focused on a number of things at the same time. Is it more important than family? No. But surely you can be more used to your family if you have money than if you need money, right? Surely. And uh, surely you can be more use to your synagogue or church or faith family if you have money than if you don't. So uh, uh, please get past the hang-ups on money. If necessary, you can read my book, Thou Shall Prosper. Maybe your family even has one in the bookcase already because it's, uh, it's a huge bestseller, um, which I'm obviously very happy about. But um, uh, if you haven't, then you need to get hold of that. It'll help you very much. It, it Really, more than 100 pages of the book are devoted to how you can overcome these hang-ups we have about money. Because you do have to be able to be comfortable saying to yourselves, is this activity good for my future money-making ability? And you've got to be able to answer that honestly and act on the results. So, uh, for instance... Um, you might be saying to yourself, you know, I'm going to become, I like massage. I'm going to become a massage therapist. Now, leaving aside for the moment the adolescent dream of somebody paying you to give massages to beautiful young women, that's not quite how the world really works, I can assure you. And uh, what, what really happens is that it is an activity with very relatively low barriers to entry. You will be competing with people who need less money than you do because they are going to be people who are not as focused on building a marriage and a family and a life as you are. Uh, it'll be people who are going to be comfortable being renters rather than people who are going to want to own real estate as you are going to want to do. And... Um, 
In fact, one of the things you may be wanting to do even while you're in this boot camp of 13 to 23 is already start buying real estate. Maybe it's going to be a fixer-upper that you're going to then own and rent. But these are things you could and should be doing that are really worthwhile doing, a whole lot more worthwhile than many of the other things that other people of your age group are busy doing at this point. So feel comfortable asking yourself, is this good for my money-making ability? We've already covered your also asking yourself, is this good for my ability to form and sustain a healthy long-term marriage? We've covered that. The second question is, is this good for my money-making ability? And I'm going to make this real simple, everybody. Those are the only two questions you need to focus on, right? I'm not worried about faith. I'm not worried about family. Those are all things that uh, will have their proper place automatically. But the ones that you are being conditioned and indoctrinated against money, money and marriage. And so in this segment, uh, we're focused very much on money. Please realize that during these years, 10 to 23, you are trying to obtain the highest, uh, the highest level of qualification of which you are capable. If you are capable of getting a degree in uh, computer science, please do not get a degree in gender studies. For heaven's sake, as a matter of fact, do not even waste any time at school doing anything, any program that has the word studies after it. Do not do um, anything. Comparative religion studies, don't do that. History of art studies, don't do that. People will tell you, oh, there needs to be the humanities. You need to study the arts. Um, You will get that from the reading you and your group wisely choose to read. Please do not waste time. Don't waste time on those courses. Try to get your highest possible qualification. Uh, If you are simply somebody who is not academically oriented, you're not going to be able to get a a degree in physics, in chemistry, in mathematics, in biology. If you can, please, that's part of the self-discipline. That's part of what you should be devoting these years to. Go for it. You will never regret it. You will find that you are way ahead in terms of the ability to make money with that kind of qualification in your back pocket. Uh, A business degree, a serious business degree, a degree with focuses on finance and sales and marketing and statistics, all of those things. Yeah, if you can do that, do it. If you're capable of these things, do them. How do you know if you're capable of them? Ask your parents. Ask uh, guidance counselors, but people who are substantive and can be trusted, uh, not people who may have their own agenda. Um, Speak to friends. Speak to a religious leader who knows you. If you happen to be part of a faith family and uh, you have a church or a synagogue led by a wise pastor or rabbi, uh, go and ask them, what do you think I'm capable of doing? If you have any doubts or any questions on this. But um, sometimes it's also just a question of doing it step by step, step by step, little steps. You start off. Uh, If you haven't yet finished high school, try and take real high school courses. If you can take calculus in your high school, please do it. Um, If you can do some of these courses in physics and mathematics in high school, do them. All right. I'm talking to guys here because I already told the girls to turn off. They're not listening to this show. They'll listen to the other shows that I'll do for them. And I'll tell you to turn off those shows on for you. But for you, you're a male between the ages of 13 and 23. Do the toughest courses you possibly can demand as much as you can for yourself from yourself and uh, again you're going to have to turn to your mastermind group to support uh, for support and to support one another in tackling some of these very very hard courses but that is going to make a huge difference in your money making ability and you really want to work on that I cannot stress how important it is in the face of a culture that diminishes the importance. In the final analysis, what the culture is really telling you is, don't worry, you can depend on government. And don't believe that for one moment. Okay, go for the hardest qualification you possibly can. 
and ask yourself when any time you're spending time, any time you are going to be uh, doing something, you say to yourself, is this good for my money-making ability? Is this something I'm doing that strengthens my connection with family? Yeah, that's a good thing. Is this something that uh, strengthens my connection with God? Yeah, I think that's a good thing as well. And I take those as givens and for granted, in spite of the fact that many of you may simply not be um, connected to to faith. That just may not be a thing for you. Uh, some of you may unfortunately have uh, less than ideal family circumstances, and I'm very sorry. Uh, but there, you know, some people are like that. People have to deal with those handicaps. Everybody has handicaps. There's no question about it. If you are blessed to have a strong faith family and a strong real biological family, then you have other challenges as well. There's no question about it. Challenges are an absolute given. Uh, the word easy and the word life do not belong in the same sentence. Right? Life isn't easy. There are challenges. And if you embrace those challenges and grab them, they make you stronger and they prepare you more effectively for a happy and successful life. My friends, uh, that kind of brings us to as far as we're going to go. I say kind of because, of course, there's more. But if you can absorb these things, if you can make these things part of your life, if you can focus on all of the things we've spoken about, and you can devote these years, this 10-year boot camp, 13 to 23, or as much of it as you have left, to building yourself up in these ways, then, my friends, as Rudyard Kipling would say, and that's something, by the way, for your reading group, for your mastermind group, read stuff by Rudyard Kipling. Uh, read stuff by Joseph Conrad. One of the poems of Rudyard Kipling um, is uh, about, then you will be a man, my son. And I don't think I can finish off this uh, conversation I've had with you men uh, without concluding with those very remarks. So, uh, if you, you will allow me, uh, the poem is called If by Rudyard Kipling. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you but make allowance for their doubting too, if you can wait and not be tired by waiting or being lied about, don't deal in lies or being hated, don't give way to hating, and yet don't look too good nor talk too wise, if you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two impostors just the same, if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, or watch the things you give your life to, broken and stoop and build them up with worn-out tools, if you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss and lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss, if you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on, if you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue or walk with kings nor lose the common touch, if neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you but none too much, if you can fill the unforgiving minute with sixty seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it, and which is more, you will be a man, my son. And so that is really how I look at each and every one of you. If you have gone through this program and you are dedicating yourself to live the most of this boot camp and live the Rudyard Kipling poem, If, and live everything we have discussed in this show, then indeed you will be a man, my son. And I cannot think of a higher form of praise. So until we are together again next week, I wish you a week of good health and prosperity. Until next week, I am your rabbi, Rabbi Daniel Lappin. God bless.